Hello, welcome to chapter 26.2 where we're going to talk about stars. So a star, just like our sun, is a large glowing ball of plasma in space which generates energy through nuclear fusion in its core. But stars are incredibly far away, so we can't measure the distances between us and stars in things like meters or even kilometers. We have to use a unit called the light year. And you've heard of the light year, but you probably don't fully understand just what it is. One light year is the distance light travels in one year through the vacuum of space. So if we let the light from our sun travel from the surface of the sun straight out through space for one year, the distance it traveled, which is actually 9.5 trillion kilometers, is one light year. So a light year is huge. And it turns out that other than the sun, the closest star to us is over four light years away. So it's four times about 10 trillion. It's 40 trillion kilometers away, which is ridiculous. But we see the stars all the time. But how do we know how far away the stars are? We can't just use a ruler or a measuring tape to measure how far apart they are. Well, scientists use a couple different methods, but one of the things they use is called parallax. Parallax is the apparent change in position of an object with respect to a distant background. So what I want you to do is hold your index finger up at arm's length out in front of your face and close your left eye. Now switch eyes, close your right eye and open your left eye. You should see whatever wall or object is behind your finger kind of shift back and forth as you switch eyes. That's called parallax and that's what scientists use to measure the distance to the stars. For example, if we look at this picture down here, in July, when we look at star A, we see star C behind it in the background. But then if we wait until January to look at star A again, instead of seeing star C behind it, we now see star B behind it. And we can measure this apparent shift, how far apart star B and star A are, to figure out how much star A looks like it's moving. And based on that, we can figure out using simple geometry how far away star A is from Earth. Now, it's, it seems like a complicated process, but it's really not that difficult. But once we find out how far away stars are, we can then classify the stars. And there are many different types of stars. Um, we classify stars based on color, size, brightness, and chemical composition, what they're made out of. So you can see in this real picture here that some of these stars are very white and some of them are very orangey red. Some of them are red red and some of them are a little bit blue. They're very different brightnesses. Some of them are really, really, really bright and some are pretty dim. Um, they're also different sizes. Some look very large and some look very small. And all of these different characteristics go into classifying stars. The first way we classify stars is using color and a star's color indicates the temperature of its surface. So remember, we talked about light and how red light has a very long wavelength, and that's because it has a very low energy. And at the other end of the rainbow, purple light has a much shorter wavelength because it has a lot more energy. Well, it turns out as you heat an object up, it will reach a point where it will start to glow and it will let off light. And the first light it starts to give off is red and then orange and yellow and green and blue and all the way up to violet and even beyond to light that we can't even see like x-rays. So the hottest stars are very, very blue and cool stars are very, very red. Now if you think about our sun, our sun is a yellow star, so it's a pretty intermediate temperature, it's in between. Um, if our sun were violet hot, it would probably be too hot to sustain life on Earth. And if it were red hot, it might not be hot enough to provide the heat and light that we need to survive. Another way that we classify stars is by brightness. And there are two different kinds of brightnesses in astronomy. Apparent brightness is the brightness of a star as it appears from Earth. So if we go back to our picture here, some of these stars might not actually be as bright as they look. But from Earth, when we're looking at these stars, some of them look very, very bright and some look very, very dim. What we see in this picture is what we call apparent brightness. On the other hand, absolute brightness is actually how bright a star really is. So if we could go in a spaceship to that star and look at it, 
That's how bright it actually is. As an example, look at these street lights here. All of these street lights have the same absolute brightness. They have the same light bulbs in them. They're giving off the same amount of light. But the street lights way at the end of the row down here appear to be less bright than the nearest ones. And that's because of their proximity to us. So that would be the apparent brightness. This appears to be less bright than this, even though their absolute brightness is actually the same. Another way that scientists classify stars is by size. And size can mean mass, and it can mean um, actual scale size, like volume and diameter. And these things are really important, but they're actually really hard to measure. Um, the mass of a star, you can't just look at it and say, oh, that star weighs this many kilograms. There's no way to do that. In order to measure the mass of a star, astronomers actually have to look at how other objects interact with it. For example, think of Earth. Earth is orbiting around the sun because of gravity. The gravity of the sun's mass pulls the mass of the Earth toward it. We can actually look out at other stars, let's say these two stars, and we can determine how far apart they are and how fast they move around each other, and that will tell us the mass of those stars, which one is larger and which one is smaller, and it will actually give us an absolute mass based on some very cool physics equations. Now size, especially the diameter of a star, is very closely related to apparent brightness. And after determining the size of a star, astronomers can assume that the larger it is, the more absolute brightness it will have. So if you think about two stars that are exactly the same size, but one is much, much, much farther away, the one that's closer is going to have a larger apparent brightness than the one that's farther away. Now, if we think about two st stars and the, the closer star um, has the same apparent brightness as the one that's farther away, we can assume that the star farther away, because it appears to be the same brightness as the one that's closer, has to be larger. It just has to be. And it has to have a larger absolute brightness than the one that's closer to us. Now, all of this is really important, but really what it comes down to is the chemical composition of the stars. So scientists get a lot more precise information about a star by looking at the color spectra um, and figuring out what elements are contained within that star. It turns out that the hotter a star is and the larger it is, the more elements will be composed um, inside that star. So some of the coolest, smallest stars only have hydrogen and helium in them, but the hotter they get, the uh, more fusion can take place in the core and the heavier elements are created, like lithium and beryllium and so on. Now, scientists know what elements are actually existing inside of a star by looking at their emission spectrum and their absorption spectrum. So we saw emission spectrums already this year. When we saw the rainbow glasses, when we put the rainbow glasses on and looked at the gas emission tubes, those little light up tubes that I put in that machine, we were looking at the emission spectrum of that element. So if we had hydrogen, which I believe we looked at hydrogen, we saw that there are a couple purple bands of light, a blue, a teal, and a red. Those are the colors that correspond to the different energy levels within the Bohr model of the atom. Now, astronomers will actually look at the opposite. They look at the absorption spectrum. And the absorption spectrum shows all of the colors that are released within a star with these dark bands here. These dark bands are the exact wavelengths of light that have to be absorbed by an electron in order for it to jump from a low level to a higher energy level. So the emission spectrum is the color of light that gets released when the electron jumps down a level or multiple levels. And the absorption spectrum are the colors of light that get absorbed in order for it to jump up a level or multiple levels. And this is how scientists determine the chemical composition of the stars. Now, the elements contained in our sun can be determined by looking at these black lines, the absorption lines. So if we look back here, Hydrogen's absorption spectrum is exactly the opposite of the emission spectrum. There are two dark bands in the purple region 
a blue, a teal, and a red. And if we look at the absorption lines from our sun, we see a couple bands in the purple, a blue, a teal, and a red. But there are also some other lines here, and those other lines correspond to other elements. So 98% of our sun's mass is composed of hydrogen, but these other lines are caused by helium. So helium absorbs some of these other purple colors, and maybe some green and some yellow, and that is its chemical um, fingerprint. That's its signature, its light signature, that tells us that the sun is made of hydrogen and helium. Now, now that we have all this information about size and color and chemical composition and brightness of all the stars, scientists came up with a model to kind of categorize all of these things. And this model is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram or the HR diagram. And the HR diagram shows us the relationship between temperature and size. But it's also used to estimate the sizes of the stars, their distances from us, their brightnesses, and even their life cycles. Because just like animals, stars actually have life cycles. So let's take a look at this HR diagram. The HR diagram looks something like this. On the x-axis, we have temperature. And you can see it actually runs in the opposite direction of what you would think. The low temperature, which is red, is way over on the right. And the high temperature, which is blue and purple, is way over on the left. So it actually goes from left to right in order of decreasing temperature. Now on the y-axis, this has luminosity or brightness. How bright is that star? And we can actually determine or I guess assume in certain situations that the brighter a star is, the larger it is. So if you look at certain areas within this um, diagram, you can see up in this corner over here, we have a whole bunch of different color stars, but all of them are very, very bright. These are what we call the supergiants. They are incredibly massive and very, very, very large stars, but they do vary in terms of temperature. Some of them are very cool and are red, and some of them are pretty hot and they're whitish blue. Now, way down here, we have what we call the dwarfs. And these dwarfs are very, very, very small stars. They, again, vary in temperature. Some are very hot and some are very cold in terms of a star, um, but they're not very large. They don't give off a whole lot of brightness. So we have the super giants and the giants. We have the dwarfs, and specifically the really, really small but hot stars are called white dwarfs. And then if you look, we have this big line right in the middle. And this big line is actually very important. This is what we call the main sequence. And all of the stars that fall on that line are considered main sequence stars. And that means they're following the normal evolution of a star and the normal life cycle of a star. Our sun is a main sequence star, which is really important because uh, it's giving off the appropriate amount of light and heat to sustain life on Earth which is, we're really lucky that our sun is a nice main sequence star. Our sun is found somewhere around here. It's on the main sequence, it's a nice yellowy color, and it turns out being here is representative of being in the middle of a star's life. And we're gonna talk about stellar evolution and the life cycle of stars in the next chapter. But this, this diagram and the fact that when you um, put temperature on the x-axis and brightness on the y-axis, the fact that you actually get a trend like this is really cool. Um, and this diagram is very important to scientists. Now, I want to show you what your homework questions are. You have four of them, so go ahead and answer these uh, the best you can and have them ready to turn in tomorrow.